Chapter 12, 1909. Alfred's legs grow upwards and his chest grows outwards as he develops his manners, morals and mind. As his classmates enter the wider community, leave school at the first opportunity and leave him far behind. Alfred wants to join them and earn an honest crust, but his mother insists, your education is a must, which puts him in a bind. The year is 1909. A German physicist is developing a cure to syphilis whilst he wears a blazer made of flannel. A French engineer is piloting the first ever plane to cross the English Channel. And a Belgian chemist is unveiling synthetic plastic. In Antarctica, the first ever steps are being made on a magnetic south pole. In America, the first ever radio show is being broadcast whole. And in Israel, the first ever kibbutz is being built by some people who are enthusiastic. Whilst the British sign a treaty to a cruise to Malaysia land, which makes them feel grand, famous, fabulous and fantastic. My notion! Alfred's mother starts to coax, having washed her hair with the raw egg yolks, which she keeps near that elastic. I really don't know what I'm going to do with you, Alfred Freeman. I don't, I don't, I don't. You're just not respectable. Your future depends upon an education. Look at me. Lawyers, accountants, bankers, they're all educated. Politicians are educated too. Education is respectable. It is, it is, it is. Really, you make an old woman all a quiver, you and your mischity, tramping around in all weathers like a pair of young lovers or a stray dog. If only you are more like your father in heaven. If only you are more like Bernie. Now there's a boy I'd be proud to call my son. Alfred, if you want to be a well-paid and well-respected member of society, you really should stay on at school. You should, you should, you should. There, that is all. But Alfred is not interested in any of the professions which his mother has just listed because they remind him of a professional who had left him twisted after his mugged in an alley which was full of dirt. The good German was not so well respected, but he was compassionate enough to be affected and wrap Alfred's wounds in his shirt. But what if I d d d d d don't want to be a banker? Alfred begins to blurt. Oh, you'd be fantastic in the army, my little soldier. His mother begins to flirt. But please, what if I don't want to join the army? You'll be a splendid soldier. A mighty musketeer. But, 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 but please, what if I don't want to be a soldier? But, 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 pretty please, pretty please with a cherry on top. Top notch, you'll be first class officer. Somewhere, somewhere, somehow, you shall, you shall, you shall. As his mother speaks, Alfred is moved by a frenzied state and the way she tries to debate with all these impassioned emotions. She strokes Alfred's arm at manic pace with concern on her face and she mirrors each of Alfred's motions. This does not assuage Alfred's guilt because he knows his mother will have to work to the hilt whilst he studies geology, geometry and Greek. His mother finds her seamstress work fairly dour and only gets paid six pence an hour, so works for 60 hours each week. Therefore, whilst Bernie has a cupboard full of games and a collection of toy trains which have been passed down from sister to brother, Alfred's father substitute chicory dust for tea, water down their curry and rely on his stepfather and mother. His parents keep their pennies close to their chest and they stay at home to rest, they do not go out or entertain. Alfred believes that if he could earn some money, his parents could afford to buy some honey or visit some places by train, that they could afford to get a barber to cut their hair, go to a country fair or drink some pink champagne. I just want to contribute, he tries to explain. You shouldn't have to struggle away just to feed and clothe me. But please let me help you. Please, please, please. Alfred's mother hobbles past these seven penny novels his military models and his potted fern. She stumbles past his paraffin lamp and his postage stamp because she is moved by Alfred's tender love and concern. You know, your father in heaven once served in a particularly queer engagement over in Benin, he says as she speaks of Alfred's father for the first ever time with a vibrating spine which makes a twist and turn. Look at me, this was back in 1897. You were just a baby in my arms back then. My wonderful warrior, you were no bigger than a small bag of carrots. Now, Benin was a rich country, full of palm oil, rubber and ivory. But by gum it was a frightful place. It dealt in slavery, and it dealt in human sacrifice. It was a closed country. The British had tried for many years to open up that small city-state. They had sent peace envoy after peace envoy to talk to their king. Oh, how they had tried to foster trade. Oh, how they had tried to negotiate an end to their god-awful barbarity. Alas, I'm afraid to say that it had been to no avail. Look at me. The envoy sent in before your fathers had come to a right sticky end. It was perfectly awful. Alfred, it was a real juice. 
Benin's king believed that our men were planning to attack him, and so he'd sent his troops to ambush us. Just two of our soldiers had survived, as a green forest turned red with rivers of British blood. Oh, it just wasn't respectable. Our soldiers were positively astir. This is our inheritance, they thought to themselves. We shall return and utterly destroy those savages. We shall treat them that their abominations are sinful. This was a mood amongst the troops. Their friends had been left in seas of blood and mountains of sorrow. They considered it unjust, improper and unfair. Oh, my vigorous fighter, how have they considered it unfair? Now, Alfred, your father in heaven knew that his mission was dangerous. He did, he did, he did. He knew that he could be ambushed at any time. But your father in heaven was stout-eyed. He was a different pair of shoes, your father. He was happy to lead his unit through the gnarled trees, tangled undergrowth and poison shrubs which filled back their forest. He was happy to lead his men along paths which are normally only navigated single file by barefooted natives. Your father in heaven didn't see a single adversary during his blind march forward, but your third them, each forenoon and each afternoon, their yells would howl, their calls would cry and their bullets would burst. Oh Alfred, all your father could do was fire back into the thicket. Look at me. Your father in heaven knew that despite the strength of his enemies and the challenges posed by that there forest, his own men could be triumphant. They were intelligent, respectable and strong. But he knew that there would be bloodshed and he was keen to protect his men. You should be the same one day. Oh Alfred, you shall, you shall, you shall. So, on arriving near Benin's capital, your father in heaven sent a decoy to distract their enemy before he climbed the cliffs which surrounded that sea. Oh Alfred, he dug a whole series of tributaries up there and rerouted the rivers towards the cliff's edge, where he blocked them all with tree trunks. Once many tributaries had been dug, your father in heaven stretched forth his hand. He signalled for his men to break down those barriers and let the water flow. I shouldn't wonder that it was one hell of a sight. Their natives fled from the oncoming waters and were overthrown in the midst of a sea which descended upon them. Those waters covered their monuments, crushed their palaces and corroded their pagan art. They thrust every member of the old regime clean away. And, as a result of your father's actions, Benin was liberated from the savages. Trade made that nation great, and your father's men returned unarmed. They did, they did, they did. Oh, Alfred, if only you could have been there. It was ever so respectable. My notion, we cannot know what dangers we'll have to face, what sacrifices we'll have to make during our own blind march forward, but we'll overcome every obstacle too, just like your father in heaven. You shall be just like him. Somewhere, somewhen, somehow, you shall, you shall, you shall. Enough of your mischief, enough of your tramping. Oh, Alfred Freeman, I know exactly what I should do with you. I should have feed and clothe you, and you shall stay on in education, my terrific trooper. You shall become respectable, and you shall become a mighty soldier who will go from north to south and east to west. There, that is all. Alfred's mother becomes soppy, shivery and sweaty as she collapses into the arms of his scraisetti, exhausted with mental strain. But Alfred is excited, dreamy, delirious and delighted, hoping his mother will speak about his father again. But he is tired of relying on stories from people like the Jewel Sergeant and things like this garment, so would love to pick her brain. He is tired of having to feed off little scraps and fill in the gaps with help from books like The Battle of Dorking, with helps from books like The Riddle of Men and The Evasion of 1910, which he reads whilst he is not walking. So hearing his mother speak, hearing her shriek and hearing her slur after so many years and so many tears shows what this means to her. Okay, Alfred starts to concur. I uh, 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 understand. Thank you for telling me about father. I hope you speak to me about him again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're better than chocolate. You're better than sunshine. You're the best mother a boy could have. So Alfred enrolls with Bernie at his brand new school, with his brand new hall and his brand new teachers who are always interfering whilst they teach new lessons in biology, zoology and engineering. Unlike his old school where the cane was inescapable, this new school provides free education for the most capable thanks to a new regime. So Alfred writes with new inky pens, makes new friends and plays for a new football team. And because he still wants to work and does not want to shirk, Alfred also helps with his stepfather's carpentry. They draft, design and draw, shape, strike and saw, which improves their relationship markedly. They make a desk for a weather forecaster, a stage for a news broadcaster, and some boxes for a dance troupe. They make some pews for a church pastor, benches for a station master, and tables for a youth group. Whilst they chew some beef jerky, munch some turkey, and slurp some mushroom soup. This work means their income increases and their poverty decreases, so they go to football and they go to play pool. Alfred's stepfather starts to shoot, his mother buys a flute, and they go to the music hall. His stepfather has friends over to play some outlandish games. 
and make some outlandish claims whilst they sing, shout and smoke. His mother attends a dance class, has some picnics on the grass and most boats which are made out of oak. Whilst Alfred does good deeds, helps people with needs and helps people who are broke. Alfred stopped taking the fishmonger's fish when he changed schools, but he remembers seeing that man clean his tools outside of his fishy shop. He was serving some fish with a spoon, sweeping his floor with a broom and wiping his tiles with a fishy mop. I don't hardly know who I are, he told a friend whilst Alfred had started to skip, slip and hop. My son is ever so poorly. He's precious hard, but I'm up to my eyeballs in his doctor's fees and I owe four pounds in taxes. I can't be a pair of that kind of money now, Al. Just three weeks income, them desh and darn it. Alfred considers the fishmonger's debt to be a worthy one, accrued in an attempt to save his son, like he was once saved from smallpox. And, having taken so much fish from his big blue can, Alfred feels a debt to that man who wears discoloured socks. So he approaches a good German who is dressed in a waistcoat, which reaches his throat with his back held perfectly straight. And he waits as his mentor locks his door, sweeps his floor and unpacks that wooden crate. Can I b b b b borrow four pounds, please? Alfred asks as he locks this wooden gate. Please, please, please. How are you going to repay me, Alfie, dear boy? The German asks his mate. Alfred is unable to reply or look the good German in his eye. So he looks down at his size five feet. He looks down at his melons, leeks, lentils and lemons and a sack of dough and wheat. You could work for me on Saturdays, perhaps, the good German suggests whilst he rests on this yellow seat, to earn bags of money, yeah? And so Alfred smiles with glee, taps his knee, and nods to agree. Because this arrangement means that he can listen to the good German's tales, whilst he weighs fruit on these scales, which are tied together with thread. It means that he can listen to his mentor quip, whilst he scrapes coins along the strip to see if they're forgeries, which are coated in lead. And it means that he can listen to his mentor's fables, whilst he arranges these tables, which have just been painted red. So Alfred finds himself hired with four gold sovereigns which he desired before he leaves this place in a dash. He puts his coins on this fish's tongue and puts his hook through its gum to lead the fishmonger to his new cash. And with a head full of grizzled hair and opaque eyes which glare, here this fisherman stands. He stamps his fishy feet to create a fishy beat and he waves his fishy hands. Get back here you besperched little scoundrel, he commands. I see what you've been a doing, a fiddling with my fish. The fishmonger gives chase, begins to race, and ups the pace. He forces Alfred to flee past this coughing typist, this hiccuping cyclist, and this burping nun, this greasy mechanic, this lisping Hispanic, and this nit nurse's son. He forces Alfred to run across his paving stones, which jangle his bones as he dodges to the right, as he dodges around his walkers, haberdashers, housekeepers, and hawkers, before he dives out of sight. Before he dives into good deeds, the obese, ordinary and old, creaky, crusty and cold, ugly, unfed, and unwell. He helps a wobbly woozy and weak, and this mute boy who cannot speak, and cannot hear all that well. This mute boy has a ghastly stare, fluffy orange hair, and gnashing orange teeth. He is grabbed by this carer who throws him through this mire, this fire, and this weed ridden heath. Whatever makes your boy angry, Alfred suggests and protests because he is horrified beyond belief. This will only make him worse. P -p 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 please let him go. Please, please, please. Alfred's challenge makes the carer agitated irked, irate and irritated and it makes him turn dark red, as if to question why Alfred was even ever born. He glares at Alfred with spiteful scorn and shakes his clean shaven head. It's out with your remit, he bellows with Jed. Aye, you didn't ken what I've done for this here wee laddie. Aye, how I stood for his madness, his turns, his biting and his stramash, his punching, kicking, pushing and a tearing. He's no muckle use to anyone. Aye, losh man, by dod. I've tried to destroy him. I, I've bared him. I, I've tried to heal him. I, but nothing will work. He's possessed by a foul spirit, I tell you. He's a bampot. I, a reet screwball. I'm just trying to calm him, get him car Kenny, so I can take him to the asylum. I, I didn't want no stushy. I've had my fill. I, I've done all that can be done. Alfred looks up at the skies while some mute boy cries with crystalline tears in his sallow eyes. We shouldn't c c c cast them out, Alfred replies. He can be healed. Please believe it. Anything is possible if you believe in it enough. And as the carer looks around, Alfred grabs the mute boy without a sound and carries him down the street. He carries him down the smoky lanes, past his smoky trains and past the smoky meat. Past his baby in a blue crib, this baby in a blue bib, and this baby who is sucking on a blue sweet. 
before they arrive at this orphanage which is full of ill-fitting bricks, wooden sticks and cracked concrete. Good day, ma'am, Alfred begins to tweet. This mute boy is being abused by his c c c c carer. Please can you house him? Please, 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 please. I'd be ever so grateful. I I'd be very much obliged. This matron with grey hair looks far from impressed, as if she is ready to reject Alfred's request, repel, rebuff and refuse. She does not have any beds, any bedspreads or any bed sheets for the mute boy to use. But the chef walks over here and whispers in her ear, which makes her change her mind. She begins to grin and lifts her chin, which makes her look caring, compassionate and kind. OK, 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 she says as her teeth begin to grind. We'll give him a go and see if he settles. Settles, settles, settles. But I'll make no promises, no guarantees. Just you wait and see. See, see, see. Alfred turns around and retreats down these narrow streets whilst the mute boy stays behind. He goes to school when he should, does deeds which are good and deeds which are kind, whilst his work at the green grocery and his work with carpentry make him more refined as he grows upwards, grows outwards and develops his useful mind.